Let's get started. Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all for being here, and um, let's talk about gRPC. So my name is Ray. I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. I'm based in New York. And I'm Meta Tamela. I'm also a developer advocate, same team as T uh, Ray, but I'm based in London. And um, we, these are our Twitter accounts, so if you want the slides, we'll post the slides after our talk, so just follow us on Twitter. And then we also have a, a talk feedback link, so bit.ly slash my last name, Atamel. If you've um, finished the talkback link, we have some gRPC t-shirts, so the first few people can get a t-shirt after the talk. So if you fill it, just come after our talk. We also have some gRPC stickers that you can get after our talk as well. Okay, awesome. So what we're going to talk a little bit about uh, first is uh, microservices because, well, how many people here are already uh, implementing microservices? Anyone? Yeah. Or looking into implementing some of those things? Yeah, yeah. So it seems to be a trend that's, um, that's uh, here to stick, right? It's, it is an architecture that will be able to scale. Uh, and many of us will probably have a monolith to start with already. And what we're going to do is to be able to break it down, right, into individual services. And now you have just more and more components you have to run. And at the beginning, what most people think about is, well, how do I manage so many services at the same time? And for that, we actually have really, really good toolings around containers, containerizations, and other platforms, platforms as a service that can help you manage these components and these uh, applications. However, one of the biggest questions, though, that we don't really think about is how do these services actually talk to each other? How do they actually communicate with each other? Um, we use REST, right, Ray? I mean, we know HTTP. We understand the gets and the puts and the posts and all that kind of stuff. We understand the semantics of REST. So that's what I use. Like, what, what, can we use REST for microservices? Yeah, so I think um, you know, that's probably the default choice today. Uh, but there were default choices uh, you know, years ago for different technology. That works really well for us sometimes, but, um, but there are some issues potentially, right? Well, first of all, if you're using REST, right, you're kind of stuck with the REST semantic. If you're like just really uh, hardline REST, right, you're stuck with the HTTP verbs, which are the guest, the post, you know, the put. And they really map well to CRUD operations against a resource. However, as soon as you start to implement more complex business logic or more complex operations, then those verbs kind of breaks down. So imagine, imagine if I want to get all the money from uh, Mate's account, right, from his bank account, right? What do I do with the rest for let's service? Do the, let's do the other way around. Uh, from your account to the my other account. way around. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say, what if I get all his money from his account, right? Do I do, I do a, a restful service to do a patch first and then, you know, deduct the money and then do another patch against my account, right? Or do I simply have like an operation that says transfer and I just give it to account numbers, right? That would, that would probably be a lot easier. So RPC um, in general, or if you move away from REST, if you move into RPC world, right, then you can implement some of these operations. You can express it much, much better. And also that in REST, sometimes you don't really get the schema. Like, yes, it's really good for a text-based protocol that you can just, you know, type whatever you want. You can create this payload, uh, hopefully not with a map, right? But then, then you have to specify the attribute names over and over again. Or you have to write your own stops. And sometimes it's not exactly type safe if you don't have those stops, right? So it, it adds to some complexity also to consume these services. And finally, REST is text-based. We went there before with SOAP-based protocols, right, with XML, and people say XML is too slow, right? But REST is also text-based, and we do see repeating text that's being sent over and over again. So it's also not as efficient as it can possibly be. Okay, but um, I think we had REST uh, RPC before. Um, I remember things like Corba, RMI, I actually don't want to remember, to be honest with you. Uh, maybe you can <laughs> remind us those uh, days where we had to do Corba. Uh, do, do people want to be reminded about, about Corba? Anyone here done Corba before? Yeah, I see. Yes. A lot of people with their hands up, right? <laughs> but yes, yeah, so, like RPC can solve many of these issues, and we have been there before. We have been building distributed systems with many of these technologies before. But, you know, I was trying to remember, remind myself about Corba. So I actually just went and searched for a Corba uh, Java tutorial right here. And I found really, really good tutorial. I'm not going to click on the first one. I'm going to click on the second one. Um, and it's a really, really great tutorial. You know, it's, it went through all the details on how Corba works and what type of things we need to get started. For example, we need to start with the IDL, an interface definition language, so that we can generate 
uh, the, the messages and the stops for other languages as well, right? And by the way, this is just adding two numbers together, right? Just add two numbers, all right? And it's a really good tutorial. Like, if I ever need to learn Corbot, this is the tutorial I will go. And then from the server side, they implemented uh, the server implementation against the stub, right? Adding two numbers together, that's great. And then I moved down and I saw, uh, yeah. Uh, so look at all the code. <laughs> right, so if I need to make a client, then I have to go through all of these things. And I'm like, yeah, that's probably why, you know, that didn't really work out. And that's out. for just adding two numbers. That's just for adding two numbers, <laughs> right. And that's Corva. And, uh, and then there's DCOM, and then there's RMI. In Java, a lot of people, you know, have been using RMI. RMI is really great, I love RMI. Uh, it's really easy to use, but if you stick with RMI, you're kind of stuck with the Java ecosystem, right? Because if you ever move out of Java, then you're kind of stuck, there's nothing else you could actually use with RMI. It would be very difficult to interoperate. And then somebody had a brilliant idea of using XML as the exchange format so that it becomes interoperable. And that's turned into SOAP. And SOAP, you know, there are actually two styles of SOAP. You have document style SOAP and you have RPC style SOAP. In many of the SOA implementations I have seen are using RPC SOAP. But like I said before, they have issues because uh, for the most part, it's gonna be uh, slower to be, processed, to be processed just because of XML and all the text. Okay, so uh, what do we have today then? I mean, if, yeah. since Corbin and RMI are so bad, like what do we have today? <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that there's a place for RPC style um, communication, especially for backend to backend communication, behind the scenes, right? Something that doesn't talk to uh, a web server, uh, so a web browser, right? But it can only be great if it's actually simple to use and it's also interoperable, and for that, that's what we have today, which is uh, gRPC, and that's what we're going to show a little bit. And um, it is something that stemmed from Google, so we actually use RPC extensively uh, in our own backends, right? We actually make 10 to the 10 RPC codes per second. Think about it. That's how much RPC codes we're making today. So uh, when we were doing this with our internal project called Stubby. That's the internal RPC stack that we use. And gRPC is really just the open source version of Stubby. Okay, and so it's Google RPC then? That, no, no. <laughs> so the G in gRPC does not stand for any company I know of. Um, the G in gRPC is actually a recursive acronym. It actually stands for a gRPC Remote Procedural Code Framework, right? And it was designed to be simple to use. And at Google, we actually use multiple different languages, right? So it was also designed to be interoperable between different languages as well. And like I said, we make 10 to the 10 codes per second. So it was also designed to be very performant. Just imagine if it's like one byte less efficient. So if every call, it takes one extra byte to make, well, that would be 10 to the 10 more bytes per second that we had to transfer everywhere, right? So it was really designed to be uh, as efficient as possible. Okay, uh, so sure. let's just talk about the gRPC basics now, what it is and what it tries to do. Um, before we get into gRPC basics, uh, first I want to point out some motivation and design principles be behind gRPC. There's actually a website that you can go to, gRPCIO slash blog.principles, uh, where you can read all of these in detail. But I want to point out a few things. Uh, first, it's free and open. I think it's very important that you rely on open source and free software, um, and that's what gRPC is. Uh, as Ray mentioned, it's very performant, uh, and you will see at, at different levels, like the connection level or serialization, everything with gRPC tries to be as performant as possible. And lastly, in distributed systems, people usually forget the fact that things are distributed, um, and, and when things work, they think that they're calling objects, and they're calling like, methods on those objects, but then um, when things don't work, they don't really write code to guard against those, right? So in gRPC, to avoid that problem, we have what we call services, and you exchange messages with services. So this way, you, you always are reminded of the fact that you're um, talking to services, and you're passing messages to those services. So these are some of the design principles, and you can read more about them uh, on the website that I mentioned. Um, in terms of how gRPC works at the high level, um, first, you define a service definition file. 
So this is basically a high-level description of what your services are that you're exposing and what the methods are on those services. Um, and I really like this because when you come into a project initially, it's really hard to get a high-level overview of what the classes are and what the main services are. But with gRPC, we have this, you have this service definition um, file written in protocol buffer. Uh, and with that, you get a really nice overview of, uh, of what the services are and what you're exposing. So from the service definition, you generate code, you generate client-side stubs and server-side stubs. So these stubs, uh, they are generated for 10, more than 10 languages. Um, and they uh, basically handle the low-level connectivity between the client and the server. So all the connection details, uh, they are generated for you. You don't have to worry about that. So once you have the service definition and you have the client sub and the service sub, then uh, you get the efficiency in serialization. So gRPC uses uh, protobufs, and, and it's really efficient, and we'll talk about that uh, um, shortly. Uh, also, if you are in .NET world, there's bond as well on over gRPC. So you get serialization not just in Java, but also in other languages like .NET. And you get connection efficiency with HTTP2, and we'll talk about uh, HTTP2 in detail later. And the other thing is connection options. So depending on what kind of application you're building, you can have unary connections where you make a request and get, get a reply. You can do server-side streaming. So for example, you're, if you're building like a stock application where the service sends lots of stock updates to your client, you can use server-side streaming. You can do client-side streaming where the client streams to the server, or you can do a bi-directional streaming where the client and the server, they send uh, messages to each other uh, all the time. And we'll actually show you an, an example of that bi-directional streaming uh, chat application later. And finally, you have options with authentication. So you can use SSL and TLS. You can do, do, do token-based authentication. Um, and you can plug in any kind of authentication that you want to do. So we try to make it um, as extensible as possible. Um, at the very high level, uh, let's imagine that you have a Java service. Um, so you generate the, the, the gRPC service for that Java service from the service definition. And then you might have clients talking to the service. So you might have a mobile client, and you, you might have a, a laptop client talking to your service, they talk through the stubs that they get generated. So all that uh, connection details is abstracted away from you. It's generated code that you don't have to worry about. Then your service might be talking to another service, but this service can be a, a Python service. And, and then your Java service, again, talks to the Python service using the stub. And then maybe your Python service talks to two more other microservices, like Golang service or, or C++ service, again, through the stubs. So the beauty of this model is that uh, the communication between the client and the server and the communication between microservices, they all happen through stubs that gRPC handles for you, basically. And the other thing is the, the multi-language support. So you, you can have services in Java. You can have services in, in Golang. So if you have different teams working on different languages, it's not a problem. All you have to agree on is the service definition. And, and then from there on, everything is generated that, that you can rely on. So now Ray will go through a simple Hello World application and show us how this looks in code. So let's take a look. So Ray, can you tell us like, what this app is about? Yeah, so, uh, so first of all, I'm going to start simple, right? Um, I'm going to go to uh, a simple gRPC server. And what this actually does is it actually just says hello, right? It's a greeting, right? hello world of gRPC. So first of all, we need to define the service definition. And that is written in the proto buffer language. Um, so the file is called .proto. I'm not sure if you can see it clearly on the screen, right? And in this proto file, uh, we can actually define multiple things here, right? So first of all, we need to make sure that we're using proto buffer three. Uh, and just like Java, we can uh, put everything in under a namespace or a package, right? And then we can define the messages. And these are the things that will ultimately get uh, turned into like a, a, a class uh, to hold these uh, objects, to hold these values. And in the message, we'll go, we can define our attributes. Uh, and uh, these are just the fields. Uh, in the message, and they are strongly typed, so you can use uh, strong typing. Uh, you can even have, um, you know, like a list of strings, for example. You can have a strongly typed map with the key and value pair. You can even have enumerations, like enums, uh, in this case. Like, right now, you may uh, be, I, I feel pretty happy, right? So there's an enum for happy. And um, at the, uh, in 20 minutes, you could be really sleepy. I, <laughs> Hopefully I hope not. not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the en end of this talk, you'd be, you could be very angry, right? So that's why you have these enumerations. So what are those one, twos, and threes? Yeah. So these numbers uh, really defines the, the uniquely defines the field or references to the field. Now, remember in SOAP, in XML, or in REST, you refer to each of the field via the text name of the field name, right? So for example, age, you have to send age across the whole time. In proto buffer, when we serialize this object, 
uh, rather than sending the field name with the, the actual name of it, we actually use the number uh, indication. So, so in this case, over the wire, we'll just send the number two in just one byte, and that will directly reference to this particular field, right? So now we get a lot more efficiency without having to send the same text over and over again. And finally, we can define the service itself. So once you define the, the payloads for the request and the response, you can then define the service. And within the service, you can define multiple RPC operations. Uh, here I only define one, and that's the greeting service. So it has greeting operation that takes in the request payload and returns the response payload. And that's a very simple unitary request, which is request and response. Okay, so what do we do after we have this service definition file? Yeah, so once you have this, right, it's not in Java, obviously, right, we have to use something to generate the Java code. And for that, we, there's actually um, Java, uh, let me see here, if you go to GitHub and go to the gRPC GitHub, which is the gRPC Java mm -hmm. GitHub in this case, okay? So it's gRPC slash gRPC Java. And in here, we actually have uh, plugins you can use, right? So to use gRPC in Java, first of all, you need the dependency. And then you need to add in a plugin to, you know, automatically generate uh, from this, from this proto file and generate the Java files for you. Now there are two plugins you can use. Um, there is a Maven and Gradle. How many people here use Maven? Maven? Wow, yeah, less than that. Yeah, uh, what about Gradle? Gradle? Okay, not many Gradle users here. I'm assuming the people who didn't raise their hand, you're using Ant? Ant? <laughs> Anyone? Now, there's always some people using it. Maybe there are .NET people. Who are .NET people here? Yeah. All right. Actually, all right. for .NET, for those of you guys, uh, there is a NuGet package that you can install, and there's a Protoc exe file, and from there you can still generate code. So we have something for .NET too. Yeah. So, so I'm just kidding, right? With the end, and you know, with even if you make file, you can always uh, be able to generate these stops. Um, yeah, so, so all you need to do is copy and paste this into the palm, and then it will tie it into the goals, right, the, the compile or compile custom. So whenever you try to package or compile your app, it will just try to generate this stuff for you. And I have this already generated, and, uh, and we can actually implement the server. So it's going to generate the server-side stub that you can extend, right? So that is the server-side stub that gets generated from so you, you this guess So you always extend from the generated stubs, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For the server implementation, you always have to extend the server-side stub. There are other ways to do it that's more advanced, but this is probably the, the easiest way to get started. And then, uh, then you implement the method. Now, here's the, here's the thing about this operation. You can see that I received the request parameter in the, f the method parameter, right? That makes a lot of sense. But I thought we only return one thing, so shouldn't the return value to be on this side? Well, actually, in this case, the return value is actually returned via a callback. And the callback is called a stream observer. This is because on the server side in Java, everything is implemented as an asynchronous service by default, okay? So this callback is really there so that we can implement everything asynchronously. And so when you're ready to return the, the, the data to the client, you just call the callback, and you can say, um, you know, here we can generate a stub, right? Going to say hello, uh, whatever uh, my name. And then we can say response observer on next, and that will then send, you know, make the callback and send the data back. And one thing I wanted to point out is that uh, this observer interface uh, really has three methods in there. That it has unnext, uncompleted, and unarrow. Now, if you think carefully, this actually maps really, really well to the reactive paradigm. Uh, if you look at RxJava or um, any of the other reactive stream-related things, they also have the similar three uh, callbacks. On and the I did also realize that there's also builders everywhere, right? So I guess gRPC yeah. in Java relies on builders to set things and then you build it to get the actual thing that you want, right? Yeah, yeah. So everything uh, in gRPC um, that's being generated is going to be uh, immutable by default. And that's why they're using the builder pattern extensively. So every time you need to create a new payload, you, you got to use the builders. And the other nice thing is that everything's strongly typed. So if you look at requests, for example, yep. you can get the name from that. You can get the age of the person. So you, they're strongly typed objects, which I really like as a... .NET C Sharp developer. Yeah. And, um, and last thing is that uh, once you have implemented this stop, the server side code, all you need to do is to, well, guess what? Use a server builder. You use the builder everywhere. You listen on the port 8080, and it gives you a server reference, and then you can add your service implementation into it, right? You don't have to specify the URLs or anything like what to listen on. Just give it the service implementation, 
and then you just call server start, and I will start the server for you in the background. And so, in order for to prevent from the main thread from um, the main thread from exiting, then you gotta wait for the termination. Otherwise, this program will just exit in like a second. Okay. Uh, what about the client? Let's take a look at the client now. Yeah. Um, so let's go here. So here we have the client. And let me just open up the client code briefly. Yeah. So you want to tell us a little bit about the client? Yeah. So I guess client is a little bit more involved. So first you need to define your connection nature to the to the server. So the type of connection. So first you create what calls a channel. So a channel basically abstracts your connection to the server. Uh, here we are saying that uh, we are using a. a a channel for this host and for this port, and then we are using plain text, which means that we are using HTTP instead of HTTPS because this is a demo and I don't want to deal with certificates. Um, and then once I do the build, I get my channel. Then after that, I need to create a stub because I talk to the server via stubs. So when you create stubs, you have two choices, the blocking stub and non-blocking stub. So in blocking stub, you, when you make a call, it blocks until you get a response. And that's what I want here because this is a Hello World application. So from the generated code, we do um, gRPC service, new blocking stub, and then you pass in the channel, your, basically your connection to the stub. And then once you have this stub, uh, it's strongly typed so you know what methods there are to call. So from stub, we call greeting, and then we know that we had to pass in a hello request to that greeting method. So we create a hello request with the parameters that we want, like Ray. Uh, he, he is trying to be funny by typing 18 for the age. <laughs> <laughs> and he's very happy. And so we, we create that and then we build it. Uh, so we got the request and then we, we send that. And since this is a blocking call, we'll get a response. It will block. And then once we have the response, we'll just print it out. So that's all there is to it. Yeah. Do you think this will work? Should we? Uh, let's try. Should we try it out? Yep. Yeah. So let's see here. I got my, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong directory. So I'm going to need to go into my server code. Oh, uh, let me zoom in a little bit. So I'm going to just go ahead and uh, do my uh, start for the server. And. There we go. Server server started. Very good. And I got my client. Um, so because I built the, the protofile into the stop, so everything just there in the package. I just have to add a dependency to it. And hopefully uh, with my client, I can just uh, make this call. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Oh. So I got uh, the message back. It says hello there, Ray. Uh, and on the server side, I can also see whatever I passed in and that we implement the, uh, the print, uh, the output, uh, sorry, the two-string automatically as well. Okay, so it's pretty simple. It's yep. very easy to use. Yeah. So let me go back here. So let's see what actually happens behind the scenes, right? So we see that it's really easy to, you know, just use the library. But what's actually happening underneath the hood? What, what's happening through the connections and all that? And first, we need to understand HTTP2 because gRPC is built on top of HTTP2. Um, and uh, what does that mean, right? So first of all, HTTP has been around for a very long time, uh, things the uh, 1990s, right? Wow. Yeah, it's been a very long journey. And in 1997, there was HTTP 1.0. And but that only lived very shortly before 1.1 came out. And then we've been using HTTP 1.1 ever since. It's been about 20 years now. Look at that. Like how many technology you know that lasts this long, right? I mean, I'm using a phone right now. I, I change my phone just every year or every two years. But this protocol has been around for 20 years. That's quite amazing. But so it's working so well for us. Well, why are we uh, talking about HTTP 2 now? What's, n what's next? Yeah, I mean, so HTTP 1.1 served us well so far, but actually there are a few problems with HTTP 1.1. Um, so when you look at um, the parallelism in HTTP 1.0 and 1.1, um, whenever you need to create a new HTTP request, you need to create a new TCP connection. So that means that you are basically limited by the number of TCP connections you have on your, on your machine. So that's not really um, that parallel. Uh, you are limited by the number yeah. of TCP connections. And also, uh, initializing connections is also expensive operations. Exactly. So the more, the, the more times you have to initialize it, it's actually uh, time spent just to do, the, to do that. Yeah, and then if you look at it in HTTP 1.0, uh, you would make a request, and then you would get a reply, and then you would make another request, and you will have to wait for that reply, and then you would make another request. So it was really simple to understand. But at the same time, every time you make a request, you have to wait for a reply before you can make more requests. But um, I, thought, I thought we had uh, a way to work around it. It's called pipelining, right? In HTTP one point something, we, we can do pipelining. That yes, yeah. So you know your stuff, Ray. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so in HTTP 1.1, we introduced pipelining. So in, in pipelining, um, the idea is you basically send uh, messages all at, all at once. You don't have to wait for the, the other one to finish. Um, but the problem in this case is that you still need to reply, send the responses in order. So if one of the responses 
take a long time, you're basically blocking all the responses of the others. And this problem is known as header line blocking. Um, so pipelining helps for sending the re requests, but it doesn't really help with getting the responses uh, asynchronously. The st stuff still blocks. So it doesn't really solve all of the problems. And the other problem that you have with HTTP 1.x is the headers. So the HTTP headers, they're quite verbose. And even though when you look at the different requests, a few things changed in the headers. They're mostly the same, but we still send those headers all the time. And then we do that in plain text. So not only we send them all the time, but we send them in plain text, so they're really inefficient. Yeah, if you ever uh, open up the, the HTTP payload and see the actual payload with the headers and the payload itself, uh, sometimes you, your message could actually be a lot less, fewer bytes than the actual header that you sent across <laughs> yes. the wire. Yeah. Um, so we realized these problems at Google. So in, around 2009, 2010, we started working on something called Speedy. Um, and then Speedy basically turned into HTTP2. So Speedy kind of transformed into what we call HTTP2 today. Um, so what is HTTP2? Um, basically, HTTP2 tries to address all the problems that HTTP1.1 has. It tries to improve the end user latency. So the, we want to make sure that the user feels like things are fast. Uh, we want to address the header line blocking issue. We want to get rid of these multiple connections because creating connections and tearing down connections, it takes a, a lot of time. So we want to get rid of that. And it, it tries to uh, minimize the protocol overhead. So all the stuff that we talked about HTTP headers, we try to minimize that. Um, and I have to point out that it, it doesn't try to replace HTTP 1.1, but it tries to make it better. Um, so it tries to enhance this HTTP 1.1, basically. So in HTTP 2, there's this notion of frames and messages and streams. So frames are the smallest chunks that you, you basically send. And they can be data frames, they can be header frames that I'll talk about in the next slide. Then combination of frames are called messages. And then messages are exchanged over what's called streams. So if you look at in HTTP 1.1, uh, if you do a post request, uh, the headers and the body will be sent together. But then in HTTP 2, we basically break that into two frames. They're binary based frames. So you would have a headers frame and you would have, have one or more data frames. So that way you can send things as, as, as they're available. You don't have to wait for the whole thing to come together to send it or receive it. So if you have a very large object you have to send across the wire, it will be uh, chunked into different data frames. Exactly. And it will be sent as we can send them. So it will be much faster. So if you look at, for example, a client or a server, where the key thing is you have a single TCP connection. So you don't have this like multiple TCP connection issue anymore. And then over this single TCP connection, you have multiple streams. So in this case, we have stream one that's sending some headers and data. And as you realize, the headers and data, they're, um, they're, they're separate, they're, so they're, they're chunked. And then you have another stream, uh, stream two, and then you have another stream, stream three, with headers and data. And the key thing here is that everything is sent, at, uh, everything is sent as they're available, and nothing is blocked, nothing is waiting for another stream or another frame. So that's the key. So over a single TCP connection, we're multiplexing multiple streams, which makes a huge difference. And I guess Ray can talk about uh, HTTP headers now. Yeah, it's uh, actually one of my favorite uh, part of it because, like I said before, the header takes a lot of space. Uh, that's what, in some cases, for a small message, right, the header is going to take most of the space. So this is how it works in uh, HTTP 1, right? Whatever header you send is going to be in plain text. So first of all, they're going to take uh, bytes. Uh, in HTTP 2, well, we're also going to send it over as well, especially the first time. But just remember, HTTP 2 is a binary protocol. Uh, what that means is that uh, even the, the methods for the gets and the puts, the, all of those things are actually uh, encoding binary in the first place. So rather than sending the word get, it actually just sends a byte over to indicate the get method. Right? But, but the headers itself, the, the key value pair, would still be sent over for the very first time. However, we do apply uh, some kind of compression. It's called HPAC. Right? So in HTTP 2, if you make another request right, with uh, the same headers, you got to send everything the same again. If you do change something, like in this case, I changed path or whatever, like that maybe one of the headers changed. Well, in that case, uh, HTTP 2, well, you know, we have to send everything. Uh, in HTTP 1, you have to resend everything again. But in HTTP 2, you only need to send the difference. And for all of the previously sent headers and the values that's already sent before, uh, the, the server and the client they maintain an index. So they can actually just, you know, indicate that which index, which previously sent values we need to use rather than resending the actual value. So you get a lot of more efficiency when you're just trying to you know, resend the request with the same headers all over. So you not only send less, but you also compress what you sent, so right. it's much more efficient than HTTP 1, basically. Yeah. Yep. 
So let me see uh, what does that mean for you, right? For for people uh, who are using HTTP two, whether you're just using for the for the uh, from the browser to browse, or if you're using HTTP two for your backend services, right? So there's a really good demo called the uh, HTTP two demo dial, and here we have. Uh, let me see if I can refresh it. Okay, so here we have. Oh, that's really that was small. Quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let me try that. Oh, right, there we go. I see it. So. There's, we have a HTTP1 connection. What it's actually trying to do is to load image tiles, right? Uh, they're actually small tiles that we have to make connections to, to load, right? So it's, every time it's trying to make a connection and load these image tiles. And there's no caching. There's no caching on these images. Now if I run the HTTP2 test, uh, you can see that it's actually a lot faster. Even though we have really fast internet here, even with HTTP2, it's, you know, two times faster in this case. So we can try this again. HTTP1 and HTTP2. Right, that's also because of all the benefits of HTTP2 that we uh, talk about. Okay, so gRPC, like I said, is literally a uh, total buffer with uh, the serialization over HTTP2, as opposed to what people typically use for REST, which is JSON over HTTP. So this way, not only do you get the benefits of HTTP2 with this efficiency, but you also get the binary encoding of total buffer. Um, that will definitely, you know, reduce the message sizes by quite a bit. But it's also faster to process uh, binary data. So just to show you a, a quick uh, difference in terms of performance, well, first of all, I have to say, of course, of course, binary data, binary RPCs are going to be faster than text, right? That's a given. But how much faster? We actually switched, uh, well, not switched, but we, for, uh, for Google Cloud PubSub, which is our messaging system that people can use today on Google Cloud Platform, we added the, the gRPC endpoint in addition to the RESTful endpoint. And they did a little benchmark, right? So, for example, uh, just for the throughput perspective, by switching over to gRPC, uh, they realized three times the gain in terms of performance. But what's even more in important, though, is if you look at per CPU performance on, on using gRPC, you get 11 times difference. That, that is significant to me. What that means is that it's definitely utilizing the CPU much, much better. And that's important as we are moving into, say, a cloud-native application. You want to beanpack your applications, you know, onto fewer and fewer servers. You really need to get that CPU efficiency. Uh, in addition, if you're running this in the mobile client, right, on the mobile devices, you definitely want the users to have faster uh, response times. You have, you want to have lower latency, and of course, you want to use less battery. So, being able to process more per CPU is definitely a great benefit. Yep, and um, what I really like about gRPC, this, uh, like all these efficiencies are nice, but for me, uh, as a person who codes in Java and C Sharp, I really like a framework that supports multiple languages, and gRPC is really good in that. So gRPC supports Java, Go, C++, C Sharp, and, and many more. And, and community, I'm sure, will add even more languages going forward. And it's supported on different platforms like Mac, Linux, and, and Windows which is great for me because I have a Windows laptop, I have a Mac laptop, so I can run gRPC wherever I am, and I really like that. Um, the other thing is connection options. So I, I mentioned this before. Um, gRPC supports multiple types of connections, so you can have unary connections, where it's just a simple request and reply. You can have server-side streaming, uh, and you can have client-side streaming, or you can have bi-directional streaming, where the client and the server, they can send messages to each other at any time. So what we're going to do in the, in the last part of the talk is we're going to build uh, an application that will use bi-directional streaming, and, it will, and we will do it in Java and .NET and see if it works. So I'll let uh, Ray explain the application a little bit. Let's see if it works. I know it works in Java. I don't know about .NET. Oh, it does work in .NET, too. <laughs> it, does? Okay. it works even better. Oh, yeah, it works even better. <laughs> You're in a Java conference, so you know. I know. I'm just trying to take people to the next level. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to uh, pull up. Uh, let me see here. Move this over a little bit. Okay. So uh, here we have a, uh, a stop that we already created. So it's, uh, so can you tell us the app yeah. first, what it is? Yeah. So I was going to uh, talk about this uh, profile. Yep. So the app is a, a chat application, right? So we're going to use bidirectional streaming. I'm going to build a, a chat server that will take a stream from different clients, right? And then we'll just use streaming mechanisms to broadcast the messages out to all of the connected clients. Uh, so, for example, um, the, the payload looks like this. We have a chat message, right? We have the front and the, the, who, who sent this message and the message itself. Um, and um, the service itself is going to be like that. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So it's got a chat operation. But to make it streaming, if you want server-side streaming, you just add stream to the return value. If you want client-side streaming, you just add stream to the request value. 
the request type. If you want bidirectional streaming, you just add stream to both sides. So now, if somebody, if a client established this chat operation with a server, now it's a bidirectional streaming uh, uh, connection. What that means is the client can continuously send the chat messages to the server, and the server can continuously use the same stream to return messages to the client. Okay, and the way I'm going to implement implement it is that um, let's see here. I implement this. Uh, I have the stop generated already, so it's, it generates this chat service input. And it uh, it uh, gives me this um, this operation, this method I need to override, which is called chat. Now look here, it is a very interesting method. It's in really interesting signature. Okay, first of all, to return anything to the client, because it is a stream and it's asynchronous, we have to use a stream observer. So this is the callback that I need to use to send data back to the client. But how does the client send data to the server in a stream? Well, from the client side, they will also have a callback that's also a stream observer that will listen on. So the server actually have to return a new stream observer uh, that it will be literally being used uh, by the client to send data, right? And conceptually, that's the case. But we're not passing references in this case. But conceptually, that's how I think about it. So in this new stream observer, whenever the client sends me a, me a message, it's going to call this on next method and I'm going to receive this message, right? And when I do receive this message, what do I do? I want to broadcast it to all of the existing connected client. So every time a new client connects, I add this observer, the, the callback observer, into a list. So if I want to broadcast everything back to the client, well, all I need to do is to say observer. I can uh, iterate over them, uh, like via a string. I can say for each of the observer, I'm going to call on next, right? That's how we send data back to the client. Uh, and when we do this, I need to give it a message from server, right, um, value. And to construct this, we can, of course, use uh, the builders. So we can say something like uh, chat message from server. I'm going to use a new builder. I'm going to build. And in this payload, I'm just going to send in the message um, that I receive, which is the value, okay? And I can assign this to a variable, a local variable, and that's all I need to do. And I really like that how everything is so strongly typed. You don't have to like, guess like which HTTP request I need to make. You just get the builder and set things you need and build it and you have it. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. That's all I need to do. Uh, but then we also have these uh, two other uh, methods we need to implement. Uh, on arrow, that's uh, whenever you have a connection arrow, you got um, uh, or a client arrow of something, um, you know, you just catch it. And I'm going to do what all good Java developers do, which is to do nothing. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, just kidding. In this case, we actually want to say, for example, uh, remove the reference, uh, and you, you do want to error, uh, handle the error somehow. I'm just going to uh, print the stack trace just in case something goes wrong. Okay? And same thing here. If the connection was uh, disconnected uh, successfully, or the client says, I'm going to leave, then uncompleted will be called. Right? So that's a successful disconnection. And for that, I'm also going to remove myself from the list. Okay? And that's all I really need to do to implement the server. Um, I'm gonna see if it works in a second. But just so you, you know, like how, how do I start the server? Well, for, like I said before, you create a new server builder, you create a server, and then you call start, and that's it. So, so it's exactly the same as Hello World. The only difference is your service implementation, basically. That, that's the difference, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do maven install. Uh, and yeah, 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 let me do that. So just so um, the, the consumer will get this package, okay? And then I'm going to run this. So I'm going to, ooh, uh, yeah. So I have this uh, Java jar, not tar, sorry. Java jar, target. And I got this uh, chat server app. I can run, uh oh. Oh, oh, I see, uh, okay, I, I, think, I, I think I know what's going on here. All right, so let me do a Java exec. And then I'm going to define the main class. Is that the, the way I do it? Yeah. And I'm going to run this with, um, what is the class name? Let me just find this out real quickly. Ah, there we go. com.google.grpc.server.chat server, right? Is that, is that how I start a new project? Yeah, there we go. Okay, whew, that started pretty well. Uh, it's listening on port 8080. All right, we're done. For the server, yes. That, <laughs> so I have to show like it actually works, right? <laughs> so for that, we're gonna do something uh, pretty crazy. Uh, it's gonna be the first time that Mitten and I do this together. Uh, <laughs> so on his screen, 
he's actually coding this in Visual, .NET. Visual Studio, the best IDE. Best Visual Studio, <laughs> I'm using IntelliJ right here. Okay, so you can see the code, right? And so he's got a, a, a Windows form application. Yep. Uh, here I have a JavaFX application. Uh, I'm just gonna show very quickly what the JavaFX application looks like. Uh, just so you know what you're going to expect if, if it works. <laughs> If it works. All right, so here's the client. I'm going to say uh, GFX run, for example. Let's see if that actually shows up. Yeah, there we right, go. So I got a name. And uh, so supposedly, if I say hello or whatever, uh, it should send to the server and uh, it should just um, you know, be able to um, uh, get the data back as well. So hopefully, by the end of this, right, we'll have a client that's written in Java, a client that's written in .NET, and we should actually be able to talk to each other. Okay. Hopefully. All right, so let's, so let's get started. So first of all, uh, we have the channel. I also have the channel here. You also have the channel? Yeah. yeah. So that's very similar. Uh, it's like a race. How many but people think the Java code will work? <laughs> oh, nobody. Wow. <laughs> How many people think the .NET <laughs> code will work? So oh, <laughs> they wow. Have, they have more wow, there's more people who believe in .NET. Okay, <laughs> let's try this. Let's try this. Okay, I also have the stub. Right, so I'm, I'm initiating the stop. Do you have a stop? Well, you know, in .NET we don't deal with stops. We have what called a, a client. You know, so we have a chat service client. That's that's what a stop okay. is in .NET. Yeah, I see. But you do pass in the channel to that client. Yeah, right? basically, I create the client with the channel, and then I, I have my chat service from there. Okay, so that's my stop. Okay, cool. So how do I? Uh, so I'm going to make a connection. I'm going to start this operation. So I'm going to use the stop I have. I'm okay. going to call chat. Okay. Yep. And for this, I have to pass in a stream observer. Okay, so Meta is doing. His yeah, so thing I, there I, as well. I do my chat service dot chat. Then with that, I get a I get a call, and I'm just going to wrap that into a using because we have this nice thing in in dot net called using that basically makes sure that my call is cleaned when it's done. So I have that. You know what? I, I do like my auto completion. I'm just saying. Okay, good. <laughs> um, All right. So how do we get data from the server, right? So so this stream of server will receive data when the server. Uh, you know, broadcast the data to all of the clients, right? So every time a new message arrives, it's gonna call on next. So in JavaFX, I'm gonna, I need to, uh, you know, put this in my UI. So I'm gonna do a run later, because uh, in Java, like UI threads and background threads don't mix well. So I'm gonna say run later, and uh, I'm going to receive the message. I'm gonna say message is uh, So I have a, a list here, I can just add things into it. And uh, I can say, uh, well, what am I going to add to my message? I'm gonna say get message dot get from. Okay, and plus a, um, so that's who sent the message, and then I'm going to get the actual message itself. Okay, get message. Okay. Okay, what I'm doing here is I'm putting everything in a while loop, so I get, I get my call, I get my response stream, so that's what we have in .NET, and then I do move next, so that basically gives me the next one, and then there we have this nice thing in, in .NET called async await, so I'm awaiting that, so basically it waits for the next message without blocking, so that's, that's kind of like the Beto uh, .NET. So with that I'll get my next message, and I, I guess I need to say like server message, and then I can say um, call re um, response stream current, so this will give me the message from the server, and then now I need to get the message from the other client, uh, so I'll say server message dot, um, I think it's message, yep. Yeah, so I have the message basically from the other client now. Is that where you are? Yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah. So the next thing I need to do is to basically format the message and display it. So that's what I'm going to work on now. Um, so oh, I'm already done with that. Oh, you're already done yeah, with that? Yeah, you're going to hurry up. You're, yeah, you're too fast, man. I can't type like you. <laughs> Auto completion, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, well, I, don't, I didn't do this before. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll do string format and then um, I'll say zero, one. And you. Is server working? Maybe you can make sure that server is working. We'll find out together. No, do it. I don't <laughs> want to stress. I'm not done yet. We're not done yet. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be so cool if it works. How many people think this will just work out of the box? Oh wow! Still nobody. Man, I should stop uh, asking questions here. I know. Don't it's, ask. It's tough. It's tough. You're adding the pressure. All right. Have you displayed the message yet? Yes. This is chat text box text, <laughs> and then. I, do, I just do display a message, yeah. so that's, that's what I do. Yep. How that's do you it. handle errors? Because I'm going to do nothing. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put try and then wrap this in a try catch. Yeah, and do nothing, and I, of I course. I see exception. Yeah, and do nothing. And do nothing, yeah. yeah. Well, no, I need to set the call. I, I, I will set the call to null so okay. that I know that my call is there, and then I'll probably throw it as well. Why not? All right. All right. All right, so, so it's great that we're doing this at the end of the talk, because if it doesn't work, we just say, oh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll disappear. <laughs> yeah. All right, no. <laughs> All 
All right, so now we are receiving messages. Now how do we send messages? So let's do this together. So for me, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah, this, I have this window manager that uh, resizes everything all the time. So that gets a little tough. So let me see here and make sure, oh my God, stop resizing. All right, here we go. There we go. Yeah, we can see everyone. All right, so for me, uh, when I have this uh, send button, I have the send, and I can say set on action. So whenever somebody click on the send action, uh, send button, I'm going to send message to the server. Well, how do I actually do that in Java? Well, remember, the server returns me a stream observer in concept, right? But in concept, I can also get this observer from the, the client stub, right? So now, this reference, whenever you say on observer down on next, it will actually send the data to the server instead, right? So I can say observer dot on next, I can construct my message, I'm gonna say new builder and build, okay? And I'm going to set the message, uh, which is uh, my message dot get text, okay? And I'm going to set the from, which is the name dot get text, and that's it. So every time I click on the send button, it will send, it will stream this data to the server, and the server is going to receive it, and it's going to broadcast it to all of the connected client, and the client will receive this message back, and then I'm going to display this into the JavaFX client. So, yeah, in the dot .NET part, we, I basically create a chat message, just like Java, and then from then on, I have this call object that I can use to send uh, messages, so from call object, I get a request stream, and then I just say write async and pass in the message, and this is an async call, so it doesn't block, so I just wait on it, and I just send a message. That's it. Yeah. Okay. And, and you, you must realize that here, we don't have any Sorry. request observers and stuff like that, because we are relying on async await or, or uh, .NET, so it, the call, to me, at least it looks much cleaner than Java, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if it works, because uh, nobody here believes it will work. All right. So, <laughs> so, so, so is, is the IP correct? Uh, yeah, what is my IP address? Hold yeah. on a second. Before you connect, um, I need to make sure it works on my local machine as well. Yep. Um, but uh, let me see here. What's my, my IP address? Now, nobody DDoS me, please. This is a live demo. <laughs> no DDoSing against my IP. All right, there we go. So that's my IP address, 192. What is it, 1031? Yeah. All right. So oh, one sec, 1031 to 192. Yeah, so while you do that, I'm just going to compile my thing, and uh, I'm going to connect first, because I want to make sure everything works yeah. on my side. Okay, I'm ready yeah. when you're ready. Uh, I'm not, never ready. So I'm going to say, hello, Mete. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, that's good, that's good. Let me try another connection. Hold on a second, hold on a second. You, oh, you want to connect as well? Doesn't work. No. Is it port 80? 8080. 8080. Yeah, did you, did 10, you connect 31, to 8080? 2192, is that right? Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, 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 here you go. 10.31.2.192. Yeah, we have some issue with the networking here. It seems to be blocking us a little bit. Uh, we work on the, oh, you know what? It doesn't work. Wait, are you on Casino uh, 2000 free Wi-Fi? Or no, you're on the other one. Hold on, give me one I'm second. I'm on Casino 2000. Okay, okay, okay. So I was on a different access point. It's my fault. Ah. Yeah, there we go, okay. All right, whew, whew, whew. So whoever didn't raise your hand, you're absolutely right. <laughs> So let me try this again. So, Mete, here's my new IP address, 1032.0.70. Because, hey, it works on my end, I'm just saying. 070. Hello. All right, the moment of truth. The moment of truth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's do it, come on. We got two minutes left, so people can, uh, you know, if it doesn't work, that's fine, we just like kind of disappear. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Oh, oh, that was close. Uh, that was close. You always give me a heart attack, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let, me, let me connect another one. I'm just going to be, um, this is what I love to do. Um, so our manager, uh, his name is Greg. So I'm going to say Greg. Right. Good job, people. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, of course, works. I'm going to be like, uh, uh, why? Thanks. I can do this all day. Do I get a race, right? Like, I, I can do this all day. But, <laughs> right? Uh, <laughs> no, sorry. Right, whatever. <laughs> so anyways. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah, uh, so that was pretty easy to do. I mean, we literally done it in about, you know, 10 minutes or, 10 minutes or so. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll see how easy it is to use um, a gRPC. Right, hopefully you can use it in your own applications. And we'd love to get your contribution as well. Uh, they're a really open community, so i want really looking forward to everybody's participation if you're using it. Please send us feedbacks as well. 
So yeah, so if you want the slides, just follow us. If you fill the talk back feedback link, come and get your t-shirt, and we have stickers. Thanks for your time. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. That, that was good. That worked. Thanks, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if we have time for questions. Do we have time for questions? Have like one minute. No, not really? Yeah. Okay. Grab so, us afterwards. But we're around, so stop by and we'll, have, we'll be happy. To.